Greetings and welcome. I'm Bill Everett, and welcome to this episode of Chamber Conversations, brought to you by the Friends of Chamber Music in Kansas City, the Piano Trio to Beethoven. In this episode, we'll explore some early influences on what would become the standard piano trio, that is, piano, violin, and cello, by the end of the 1700s. We'll then explore how Haydn and Mozart treated the ensemble, how the Romantic writer E.T.A. Hoffman envisioned Beethoven in terms of Haydn and Mozart, and finally, how Beethoven transformed the essence and expectations for this particular combination of instruments. We'll start in the early part of the 1700s during the Baroque era. Many composers at the time created works for a single line melody instrument, such as the violin or the flute, and basso continuo. Basso continuo is a specific type of musical support that includes one instrument providing harmony, that is, the notes that support the melody. This would usually be a keyboard instrument, but could also be some sort of plucked string instrument, such as a lute or a guitar. There would be another instrument to reinforce the lowest sounding bass line. One often would find a cello, a viola da gamba, or a bassoon taking on this important role. At that time, the most common keyboard instrument for trio sonatas was the harpsichord. When put together, there'd be three instruments featured, perhaps a violin, a harpsichord, and a cello. Here, we have the essential scoring for a keyboard trio. As the century progressed, another genre rose in popularity, the accompanied sonata. These were works in which the keyboard instrument was the star. The keyboardist would be accompanied by a single line instrument, such as a violin or a flute. Sometimes a cello part would be added to this texture. Here's the opening of an accompanied sonata by the Swedish composer Josef Martin Krauss from 1785. Notice how the piano is primary and the violin is almost incidental. Accompanied sonatas were extremely popular, especially for the domestic amateur market. Publishers encouraged composers to write them since they, the publishers, knew such works would sell. Aristocrats with musical training often enjoyed playing accompanied sonatas. In 1789, a job advertisement appeared in a Viennese newspaper for a servant whose duties would include playing the violin and accompanying his employer on keyboard sonatas. When it comes to the piano trio proper, it was Joseph Haydn, one of the most important figures in European music of the late 18th century, who codified the genre with 45 piano trios. We should remember here that Haydn was also known for codifying the symphony and the string quartet. Haydn's vision for the piano trio is closely related to the idea of an accompanied sonata. The piano part is the most important, and no real sense of equality exists among the three instruments. Basil Smallman, in his History of the Piano Trio, calls these works, quote, enhanced piano sonatas, end quote. They are unpretentious and charming works that demonstrate many of Haydn's stylistic hallmarks. These include a fondness for classical design in which formal symmetry and melodic balance remain at the fore. Haydn is a great fan of largely diatonic harmony. 
that is, notes that exist within the key itself. For example, all the white keys of the piano would be what we now call C major. Haydn, though, being Haydn, had a true gift for inserting well-placed and attention-grabbing pitches that were not in the key in his works. We could think of this as Haydn strategically adding pitches played on the black keys of the piano among the more plentiful white ones. During Haydn's two extended visits to London in the 1790s, he was captivated by the robust sound of English pianos, which was a different sound than he was used to, the more fragile sound typical of instruments coming from Viennese piano makers. Haydn, always on the forefront of innovation, decided to write for this captivating English instrument. For his second visit to London in 1794 and 1795, Haydn created three trios with this new English instrument and its sound in mind. As would be expected, not just because Haydn favored piano-centric trios in the tradition of the accompanied sonata, but also because of his fascination with the English instruments, the piano features prominently in these works. Having said that, though, there are glimpses of independence in the violin and the cello parts, though the violin and the cello often double parts in the piano. To experience the charm and elegance of one of these piano trios written for London, here's the first movement of Haydn's Trio No. 32 in A major, performed by the Griffin Piano Trio.
When it comes to the piano trios of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, a greater chamber music ideal is evident in that all three instruments are of relatively equal importance. What we heard glimpses of in Haydn comes to the fore here. For example, in the first movement of Mozart's piano trio in G major from 1786, at one point we hear the violin and the piano providing support for the cello's prominent role. This is a change from Haydn. The interplay between parts echoes the sense of musical and dramatic interaction that Mozart creates between the characters in his operas. Themes take on their own personalities, and the manner in which they are presented is not completely unlike what Mozart does in his operas. In June 1788, Mozart wrote to his friend Michael Puchberg, when shall we have another little music making at your house? I have written a new trio. The trio to which Mozart was referring was his piano trio in E major, Kirschel 542. This letter shows how playing chamber music, including piano trios, was considered a pleasurable domestic activity. Here's a short excerpt from the third movement of this particular trio in which, after the violin plays the melody, it moves to the piano as the violin and cello offer sustained underpinning before the piano leads the trio of instrumental voices into the next section. Mozart and Haydn were products of an era known as the Age of Enlightenment. The Age of Enlightenment was characterized, in part, by a philosophy in which reason and logic were being cultivated as means towards building more just and democratic societies. These would be societies in which certain human freedoms would be valued. One could say that the logic-driven formal design in Haydn's piano trio and the egalitarian relationship between the three instruments in the examples by Mozart are indicative of Enlightenment ideals. German philosophy figured prominently in Enlightenment thought. 
of special importance is the 18th century thinker Immanuel Kant, who described what became known as the dialectic or the dialectic method. Oxford Languages offers one definition of dialectic as, quote, inquiry into metaphysical contradictions and their solutions. To repeat, inquiry into metaphysical contradictions and their solutions. Another German philosopher, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, furthered the idea in the 19th century. Hegel's explanation posits a thesis or an idea which produces an antithesis or an opposing idea. The tensions between the two ideas, their metaphysical contradictions, allow for their synthesis or their inseparable combination. The resulting synthesis then becomes its own thesis to which an antithesis emerges and the process continues. But what does this bedrock of German philosophical thought have to do with music? One of the most famous writers of the early 19th century, E.T.A. Hoffmann, applied this type of thinking to the relationship between Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven in his essay, Beethoven's Instrumental Music from 1813. Hoffman is perhaps best known for his fantastical tales, including the novella, The Nutcracker and the Mouse King, which was the basis for Tchaikovsky's ballet, The Nutcracker. I'm indebted to Dr. Scott Baker for his insights as to how the dialectic applies in this particular essay. In Beethoven's instrumental music, Hoffman posited Haydn and Mozart as thesis and antithesis. He wrote of Haydn, his thesis, in a characteristic, highly florid manner, and I quote, in Haydn's writing, there prevails the expression of a serene and childlike personality. His symphonies lead us into vast green woodlands, into a merry, gaily colored throng of happy mortals. Youth and maidens float past in a circling dance. Laughing children peering out from behind the trees, from behind the rose bushes, pelt one another playfully with flowers." End quote. These bucolic images give way when Hoffman describes the antithesis in his essay, Mozart, and I quote, Mozart leads us into the heart of the spirit realm. Fear takes us in its grasp, but without torturing us, so that it is more an intimation of the infinite. Love and melancholy call to us with lovely spirit voices. Night comes on with a bright purple luster, and with inexpressible longing, we follow those figures which, waving us familiarly into their train, soar through the clouds in eternal dances of the spheres." End quote. Haydn's youthful serenity, the thesis, and Mozart's fear-inspired sense of the infinite, the antithesis, play against each other, the synthesis being Beethoven's instrumental music. And to quote Hoffman, Thus, Beethoven's instrumental music opens up to us also the realm of the monstrous and the immeasurable. Bursting flashes of light shoot through the deep night of this realm, and we become aware of giant shadows that surge back and forth, driving us into narrower and narrower confines until they destroy us. It is only in this pain which consumes love, hope, and happiness, but does not destroy them, which seeks to burst our breasts with the many voiced consonants of all the passions that we live on, enchanted beholders of the supernatural." End quote. Hoffman, in his writing, is transforming Beethoven from a mortal human being who puts musical notes to paper into a conduit for the metaphysical. He continues, and I quote, Beethoven's music sets in motion the lever of fear, of awe, of horror, of suffering, and wakens just that infinite longing which is the essence of Romanticism. Hoffman wrote his essay in 1813. In 1795, less than 20 years earlier, Beethoven's first major published compositions appeared, his Opus I, 
opus numbers referring to the order of publication. These works had their public premieres in the Viennese palace of Prince Lichnowsky, to whom they are dedicated. And what were these works through which Beethoven made a celebrated Viennese debut? A set of three piano trios. Before exploring what makes this trio of trios distinctive, let's spend a bit of time with the salient features of Beethoven's music. Beethoven's stylistic output is typically and conveniently, perhaps overly so, divided into three periods, early, middle, late. The early period goes to about 1803 and is sometimes called the imitative period, though that descriptor really isn't accurate. Beethoven isn't imitating composers like Haydn and Mozart, but rather demonstrating his thorough understanding of late 18th century musical practices rooted in Enlightenment thought, while also giving the music his own unique imprint. The middle period lasts from 1803 to about 1815 and is sometimes dubbed heroic. This is when Beethoven's famous works filled with pulsating heroism and optimism, such as the very famous Fifth Symphony, appeared. Finally is the late period, which includes works created after about 1815. It is sometimes called the introspective period because of the music's comparative interiority and sublime qualities. For me, I like to think of these three periods in terms of energy, potential energy in the early works, kinetic energy in the middle ones, and dissipated energy or a vapor trail in the final ones. The controlled dynamism of the early works, we know that energy is present, gives way to power and fury in the middle ones that bring about a sense of repose in the later pieces. Energy is present in these early works, not yet fully released. It then erupts in the middle period works, and afterwards we relish in its autumnal glow. Beethoven wrote piano trios during his first two stylistic periods, though curiously not in his third one. During the early period, in addition to the three trios of Opus I, there's a trio for clarinet or violin, cello, alternate bassoon, and piano from 1797. In three movements, the final one is a set of variations on the tune Priaccio Le Pegno, Before I Go to Work. During the middle or heroic period, there's three trios and two sets of variations. Two of the trios were published as Opus 70, while the third, the majestic Archduke Trio, has its own opus number. The Opus I trios weren't Beethoven's first efforts in the genre. There are two trios from the early 1790s that weren't published during Beethoven's lifetime, a three-movement trio in E-flat major and a single movement marked Allegro. Neither were the performances of the Opus I trios at Prince Lichnowsky's palace the first time anyone in Vienna had heard of Beethoven. Beethoven had moved to Vienna three years earlier and was well on his way to establishing a strong musical reputation in the Habsburg capital. This performance, though, was a watershed moment in Beethoven's rise to fame. The Opus I trios, as would be expected, reflect Beethoven's understanding of the music of the late 18th century including Haydn's use of form to express musical meaning and Mozart's ability to create theatrical musical drama. The first movement of the first trio, noble in nature befitting its dedicatee, is in sonata form. As is the norm for sonata form movements, two contrasting types of musical ideas are presented in the exposition. Here, the first is characterized by a short recurring upward gesture and the second by unfolding lyrical elegance. These musical essences are explored through various musical manipulations in the central development section. Here, Beethoven deconstructs the themes into smaller parts, which are then passed among the three instruments. The recapitulation 
signifies the return of the themes as complete entities, and a coda brings the movement to its end. Also of special significance is Beethoven's use of dynamics, or volume, to create a sense of imminent energy. Notes marked very loud appear in close proximity to others marked very soft. Already in this early work, we hear that awakening of what Hoffman calls an, quote, infinite longing. Here's the first movement of Beethoven's first piano trio, Opus 1, Number 1, performed by the Griffin Trio at the Tippett Rise Art Center in Fishtail, Montana. Thank you. 
Before we leave Beethoven's Opus 1, let's spend a bit of time with the third trio in this set. It's in C minor, a key associated at the time with dramatic fury. Different keys at the time had different emotional affects. Haydn, Beethoven's teacher for a while, advised Beethoven not to publish this trio. He, Haydn, thought it was too radical, especially the last movement. Beethoven didn't follow his former mentor's advice. Perhaps Haydn recognized in the work, to paraphrase Hoffman, too much fear taking us into its grasp. Here's a bit of this highly impassioned final movement. writing this set of trios, and before embarking on a pair of middle period piano trios 13 years later, Beethoven composed sonatas, works, for cello and piano, and also for violin and piano. He thus explored the relationship between each string instrument and the piano, and when he returned to the piano trio medium in 1808, it came with a greater expertise at writing for each individual string instrument and piano. The pair of piano trios published as Opus 70, Work 70, in 1809, were written while Beethoven was a guest at the estate of the Countess Marie von Erdödy, to whom Beethoven dedicated the set. These works exemplify Beethoven's middle period, the heroic period, or those pieces that exhibit kinetic energy. Furthermore, these are the very pieces that prompted E.T.A. Hoffman to write his effusive essay, Beethoven's Instrumental Music. Hoffman wrote, directly addressing the composer, and I quote, with what joy I received thy 70th work, the two glorious trios, for I know full well that after a little practice, I should soon hear them in truly splendid style. And in truth, this evening things went so well with me that even now, like a man who wanders in the mazes of a fantastic park, woven about with all manner of exotic trees and plants and marvelous flowers, and who is drawn further and further in, I am powerless to find my way out of the marvelous turns and windings of thy trios." End quote. Hoffman acknowledges that these works will require repeated hearings and study in order to better appreciate them. He continues his ontological praise for the trios, now addressing the reader, and I quote, despite the good nature that prevails, especially in the first trio, not even accepting the melancholy largo, or slow movement, Beethoven's genius is in the last analysis serious and solemn. It is as though the master thought that in speaking of deep, mysterious things, even when the spirit, intimately familiar with them, feels itself joyously and gladly uplifted, one may not use an ordinary language, only a sublime and glorious one. The dance of the priests of Isis can only be an exultant hymn." End quote. Beethoven's dynamic energy is immediately evident in the explosive unison opening of the first trio, immediately after which more lyrical material emerges. trio carries the nickname Ghost because of its slow movement, the melancholy movement Hoffman mentioned. Early listeners thought the eerie sound summoned by the piano tremolos, a quick alternation of pitches, stark textures, and the low register in the cello to be ominous and perhaps even otherworldly. 
Several writers heard aural echoes of Shakespeare tragedies, including Macbeth and Hamlet, both of which include ghosts. After a brief introduction, a plaintive melody appears in the cello to which the violin and the piano offer atmospheric underpinning and musical commentary. That quintessential aspect of chamber music and equality among the parts is clearly evident here. This excerpt starts just before the entrance of the cello melody. Soon thereafter, we hear the passage that inspired the trio's nickname, Ghost. Namely, unstable harmonies. We don't know what's really happening. These thwart expectations. Furthermore, there are stark textures that lurk softly in the lower registers. Turning to the second trio of the set, the expected middle period energy and optimism of Beethoven infuses the entire work, including the final measures of the fourth movement. Beethoven's final piano trio, the Archduke, exhibits a grand four-movement design in which symphonic expansiveness is mapped onto a work for only three players. Beethoven proves that intimacy and big ideas are not mutually exclusive. This Archduke trio, Opus 97, gets its nickname from its dedicatee, the Archduke Rudolf, 1788 to 1831, the younger brother of the emperor. Rudolf himself was a gifted pianist and studied piano and composition with Beethoven. The two became friends and the Archduke became one of Beethoven's most ardent patrons. Beethoven ultimately dedicated 14 works to the Archduke Rudolf. The first public performance of the Archduke Trio took place on April 11th, 1814 in Vienna. Beethoven, as pianist, was joined by his friends Ignaz Schupanzig on violin and Josef Linke on cello. The performance did not go well, and several people in attendance, including the violinist and composer Louis Spohr, attributed this to Beethoven's increasing deafness. In fact, after a repeat performance of the trio a few weeks later, Beethoven never appeared again in public as a pianist. From the onset, Beethoven promises grandeur on an epic scale. This is accomplished through the elegant, expansive opening theme in the solo piano, at the end of which the strings enter and prepare for a statement of the melody by the entire trio. In some ways, this opening harkens ahead to the late works of Beethoven. Intense kinetic energy is no longer necessary. A 
among the highlights in the movement's development section is an exquisite dialogue based on a version of the opening theme, with the first five notes omitted, between the cello and the violin that is supported and subsequently commented upon in the piano. In this episode, we've explored some precedents for the piano trio, such as the accompanied sonata, how the genre was handled by Haydn and Mozart, and through the writings of E.T.A. Hoffman, how Beethoven can be seen to represent a synthesis of Haydn's bucolic innocence and Mozart's spirit drama. To quote Hoffman, Beethoven in his piano trios, as in his other work, quote, wakens that infinite longing, which is the essence of romanticism." End quote. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Chamber Conversations, the Piano Trio to Beethoven, brought to you by the Friends of Chamber Music in Kansas City. Until next time.